Hey guys, I'm Sumit. I work at Facebook. We're right in New York as well as in California. Um, my colleague Antoine will also be speaking later today. So I'll be talking about unsupervised learning and uh, adversarial networks today. Um, first, I want to give you guys uh, an overview, uh, talk about unsupervised learning, just briefly explain what that's supposed to be, and then talk about uh, generative models and generative adversarial networks. And then uh, I will talk a little bit about what do you use these things for, in, like practically, and then finally, um, just talk a little bit about speculative, like what's next kind of stuff. So to start off with, let's... Um, let's think of a uh, learning machine in general. Like it could be you as a person, it could be your dog, it could be an artificial neural network. So let's say there's a learning machine, like that thing in the green. And it has a bunch of inputs and it has a bunch of outputs, like coming in, going out. So now, generally, um, all these learning machines, they have feedback. Like, they improve themselves over time, uh, correcting uh, what the outputs are supposed to be compared to what they were, and uh, they basically improve themselves. And what we call supervised learning is if the learning machine, um, so the red box is what I call uh, the, uh, the uh, what, what is, uh, just the environment with respect to the learning machine itself. So the learning machine, now it's getting inputs from the external world, and it has outputs going out to the external world, and something in the external world is comparing the outputs that it produced to some real, like, ground truth target, some, some oracle. Um, and it will give the learning machine some reward, um, positive or negative, and the learning machine will improve itself. This is called supervised learning if the rewards are given by an external agent. And usually, we, uh, in, in the case of uh, um, most practical ML applications, we have the ground truth data of what you're supposed to predict, and then you see what you predict, and then uh, there's an objective function that corrects the learning machine. Now, what we call unsupervised learning is that your objective and your rewards are intrinsic to the learning machine itself. What this means is you, as the learning machine, play a few games of all kinds, and you learn by yourself what's supposed to happen and what happened. And like these are small games you play. For example, when you take a child, like the child that runs into all kinds of objects and doors and like hurts themselves and so on. And then eventually they learn that physics works this way and you shouldn't run into things and stuff like that. And like we play a lot of these games. When we play puzzle games, um, we have like a big jigsaw puzzle and we try to put them back. And as we do, um, as we play all of these implicit games, we get a certain understanding of the world that we didn't have before learning physics in general, or uh, learning to uh, go from, learning to learn, uh, learning to navigate. Uh, like if I want to go from one place to another, I've never been into the first place or uh, to the uh, place I'm supposed to go, but I kind of know how to get there. And that I learned implicitly by navigating through other things and knowing how in general I have to walk from one place to the other and so on. So. That's the central idea of unsupervised learning. You play an implicit game with yourself. And why is this useful? So let's assume that the, the learning machine is some stack of uh, layers of learning. And the, the layers take the inputs, the, and the input slowly transforms through each layer of your learning machine, and then uh, the output is produced. So, when this is useful is when you have this hierarchical uh, learning machine. In general, neural networks are like that. They have multiple layers. And you want to do some implicit tasks and learn, learn some priors of the world from uh, using your uh, unsupervised learning uh, method. And then you eventually want to do some other task that is actually supervised by the world. And you get rewards from the world. Instead of Instead of doing that task from scratch, 
what you would do is you would use part of the information that you learned using your unsupervised algorithm, and part, uh, and you will have other layers in yellow, for example, that are specific to the external algorithm, and you would uh, do better than simply starting from scratch uh, and trying to learn how to do this new external task, because you have a lot of implicit, informa implicit information that you learned uh, about the world. So this is typically how, um, once you do unsupervised learning, you would use it for practical purposes. Now let me uh, talk a little bit about um, the next part, which is generative models and generative adversarial networks. What generative models are, are let's think of a learning machine uh, that takes in some input, some number, uh, from minus one to one. Minus one means a dog and one is a cat. And it can take the number continuous, like minus one, minus 0.5, and so on. And it has to generate an image of a dog or a cat, and if you are really in between, a dog cat of some sort. Um, this is a generative model. It takes in some input, and the input can be, say, random noise. So let's say I want to learn a generative model for all possible natural images, or like a generative model of um, all drawings ever done by children. Like, these can be generative models, and the input doesn't necessarily have to be some semantic label. It can just be some noise that in, in this uh, latent, we call uh, the input latent space. Um, it can be some uh, part of the latent space, and depending on which part you pick, it will generate a new uh, drawing, for example. So these are generative models. And usually in our research that I'm doing and like you know a bunch of people are doing and that's interesting these days, the generator is a neural network. So in terms of unsupervised learning, the game you're playing here is to simply observe and reconstruct. So you observed a bunch, like you, you looked around the room, you uh, are learning how your environment works. The game you're playing here is simply to reconstruct the environment, just like paint whatever you saw back onto a sheet of paper. And doing this process, um, there's an expectation that you will learn something about the semantic uh, things about the world by just doing the simple implicit game. What are adversarial networks? Adversarial networks takes this one notch up. Instead of just having one model that learns by itself, you have two models. One model is trying to be a generative model, just trying to produce uh, some generations, let's say in the context of this talk, images. And then you have a discriminative model that takes images from the generative model and then images from the real world. And then it's trying to say, ah, I know that's a fake one. That's by a generator. Oh no, this is a real one. This is definitely, I've seen this before. Like, so the game being played here is very simple, but it's very, very powerful. So you, typically the generator will take some random noise as input, and then it produces an image, and the discriminator predicts whether that image was uh, real or not, and then get, it gets some uh, reward for depending on the correct answer, and then it ha the optimization will both improve the discriminator and the generator. The generator here is trying to maximize um, fooling the discriminator, and the discriminator is trying to minimize fooling itself. And you can think of this as you're learning a very complex cost function of how the world works and how reward structures work. And usually generative adversarial networks, or neural networks in general, are trained via this method called gradient descent, where you get a reward at the output and then you simply um, each neuron in your uh, model adjusts itself slightly depending on how much it contributed to the bad part of the output. So adversarial networks were invented by uh, Ian Goodfellow in 2014, and they were used to do image modeling, just predict uh, what will happen, uh, like just predict, like generate images, like draw images essentially. And 
these were the samples that were produced uh, in his paper. And at that time, these were the best we could do in terms of generating images. And these look terrible, right? Like, so, and since 2014, as a field, we've made a lot of progress. And um, we subsequently, me and my colleagues at FAIR, published a paper called Class Conditional GANs, where we simply changed the, uh, changed the model to not just take noise, but also take a particular class um, that you want to generate. And we started producing uh, samples per, uh, with respect to particular classes that are very, very, getting, like, were much better than the original Adversarial Networks paper. I mean, you have a lot of good generations, and uh, frog is particularly bad, but evolution has made frog to, like, um, not, you shouldn't be able to detect frogs in general. And I think that's the explanation we got for bad frog generations. Um, and then some of my colleagues at uh, Facebook have also taken these GANs to a different approach. Uh, similar to how Carl spoke earlier, where you want to predict what happens next in a video, the idea here is you don't just predict what action happens next, you literally draw the frames of what will happen next. And using a traditional neural network without the adversarial network, uh, they have a very blurry, blurry uh, generation of what will happen next, and when they use adversarial networks, they uh, got much better results. Now you might be thinking, why is this all important? We, uh, subsequently I published a paper uh, that improved the generation process by a lot, and one thing we found, which is very interesting, is that without, like, just playing this unsupervised game, the adversarial network was able to learn very semantic things about the world without knowing what smiling is, without knowing what glasses are, it was able to do all of these very cool visual arithmetic implicitly with, with its implicit knowledge. And like here I show that we took generations of man with uh, glasses and we took generations of man without glasses and we took generations of woman without glasses and then we simply added the latent vectors with respect to that and then we tried to generate what what that resulting latent vector would be, and it was woman with glasses. And this is all an implicit learning uh, that, that was there. And as I earlier explained, we will show, how, we actually showed in this paper how to use the GANs feature representation to um, actually you do some other supervised tasks. And that, the resulting uh, effect was that you would need much lesser labeled data uh, you can use large amounts of unlabeled data to train your system initially, and then finally, when you have a particular task you need to uh, train the system for, the amount of labeled data you need is much, uh, very little. So what we showed was, if we just have a thousand labels for a particular task, for a uh, traffic sign, uh, this is uh, house number, uh, digit recognition, we, just with a thousand labels, we get to an error rate of 22%, something that was better than uh, all the other methods out there, including, for example, nearest neighbors, classification, and so on. And some cool examples I want to quickly show, in painting GANs for, uh, from Berkeley, where you simply, uh, the GAN paints what was supposed to be there, um, if you give an input uh, with uh, patches of uh, missing information. And some, like, depending on the latent vector you give, you will get different predictions of what might be there at that particular uh, patch. And then there is a text to image. This is from uh, University of Michigan, where you give a particular uh, caption and then it will uh, generate the corresponding image. And very impressive results as well just using the adversarial networks. Lastly, I wanted to talk about why this is extremely important. Unsupervised learning is going to be pretty hot and successful. Just to give some evidence, in the same semi-supervised learning case, uh, doing digit recognition, um, people from OpenAI published a paper that got 5.8% um, error rate on uh, just using a thousand labels. Like this is, a data, this is an academic data set, this is an academic benchmark, and the error rate is at 5.8%.
using an unsupervised method just with a thousand labels. To give you context, in 2012, I myself published a paper on the same data set using a fully supervised connet. And we got 5.1%. And at that time, this was, that number was the state of the art on this data set. And we used 700,000 labels. And the amount of data you need to train this, the amount of label data you need to train um, has reduced by, what, three orders of magnitude. This, that's one of the reasons I would say these things are very promising. That's all I have for this talk. Um, and what's next is we want to do better prediction of what happens next and use that in supervised tasks. Thank you.